competitive. Typo's the kind of band that doesn't have casual fans. You're either really into it or you're not. And um, those yeah. fans are still passionate to this day. And there's always a kid who's going to be finding those records for the first time. There's always a girl who dyed her hair black and heard typo negative. And I, I think that that band is really going to live forever. And the music, I don't think, will ever be dated. Um, I, the, the music when it was new didn't fit in with what was going on, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, years ago. And it's, uh, I guess the same can, you know, the same thing can still hold, hold true today. But it does seem like it's, you know, it's, it's become like one of those things. Like if you get into that kind of music, it's like one of those bands now, it's like you, you're, you know, a friend will be like, you have to check this band out. Well, you're, you're almost, you know, you're like the godfathers of goth metal or, or, or something, you know. It's, uh, well, we definitely have, we have a place in it somewhere. We never, uh, for the most part, we never really saw what we were doing as goth. We just saw right. it as like, you know, we were just making, you know, garbage. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that term was kind of given to you later. Uh, well, yeah, well, I mean, you know, it didn't help. It didn't help that like, you know, everybody in the band had long black hair or singer had fangs. And, you know, it, 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 like the imagery that a bunch of the music did portray a little bit, it was easy to fall into that category. Yeah, no, know, John, it, it, th that. Things have expanded quite a bit, though, you know, since then. Right. You know. I'm assuming everyone watching this knows Typo Negative. But if you had to describe the band to somebody who maybe not, doesn't know, how do you do it? <laughs> I always saw, like, the, the tie-ins to, like, a... Uh, uh, more like you know like like metal like black sabbath that was like the the primary influence of the band there was a lot a lot of influence from stuff like the beatles of course which you know maybe your typical metal band won't really draw on them for you know for inspiration but um there was also like this uh you know the band had its hardcore roots you know, with Peter coming from Carnivore, so there was a there was like that very aggressive kind of stuff on the first record, and then you know things took a turn, but it, it's still the roots were still there, and there was always something like that that was always a you know like a, a reference to to our past on on every record that we did pretty much, and you know and I I noticed I picked up on things well you know like being in it and notice you know knowing you know like the stuff that you know the other guys were into you know musically you could see that it was you know there's some stuff to me that's plain as day that's like you know right off of like you know like 80s like pop music like you know like Duran Duran and Peter loved Devo and so you could see things like that, knowing where it's coming from. You say, "Oh yeah, I could definitely see that. I, you know, I could see where this is coming from." You know, so it was like it was like a mix of everything. But at the end of the day, to me, it sounded like Black Sabbath. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can definitely see the Sabbath yeah. um, influence. But so going back, Johnny, you were working in um, in Brooklyn in a recording studio, if I'm right. Rehearsal and, studio. Rehearsal yeah. studio. And guys like Carnivore, which was Peter's uh, other band and first yeah, band. Yeah, yeah were coming and going and you knew, I mean, you grew up with the guys from Typo Negative, right? Pretty much. Yeah. Kenny and I have been friends. I met Kenny when I was, I was still in high school when I met him. I think I had just turned like 17 years old or something like that when I met him. And, uh, uh oddly enough, I, I knew Sal before I knew any of the other guys. Sal and I were, were friends when we were kids. I met, I think when I first met Sal, he must've been like 13, 14 years old. Uh -huh. Something like that. Yeah, it was pretty young. Like we were all, even though there was a member change in the band, we all, all five of us come from like the same neighborhood. I, I could walk to each one's house from where I lived. You know, every everybody was relatively, you know, it was relatively walking distance from each other. Yeah, and so, so that, Sal was the original drummer for Typo yeah. Negative up until uh, 93. And yeah. He played on uh, the Bloody Kisses album, which would mm -hmm. probably be, you know, the band's, um, you know, that's, that's the most popular record. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so what's interesting to me now, they say that you were the drum tech. Were you like the all the time drum tech? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I did. A, I did a few shows. They had a couple of shows that were out of state that uh, they basically needed somebody else to help drive. I wasn't a very good tech. I'm definitely better at being in the band than teching for the band. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, but they needed just an extra set of hands and an extra person to help with the driving. There was one show we drove cross country to, to play a show at the Palladium in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And so we drove all the way across the country and then we drove back. And the whole thing for us, like, you know, with the drive, well, we flew Peter there and then, yeah. And then the rest of us drove. And I mean, it, the whole thing took, it took about two weeks, like, you know, to do the one show. That's crazy. But at the same time, like, you know, I was like 22 years old. I, you know, there's no rush to really have to go anywhere. There's no responsibilities or anything. Probably one of the best times I've ever had in my life. And I wasn't even playing in the band. Yeah. And, uh, and then there was another show like that where they had a show in, in Atlanta. So uh, they had me and another friend of ours, Joe Bravo, who who grew up in Atlanta and then lived in Brooklyn. He was like, look, I'll, I'll, I'll go and I'll help out if I could just take the ride. <laughs> I want to go back to Atlanta. <laughs> That's so funny. And that was an, that was another trip. You know, we we all jumped in the van and then we helped. I, I mean, I was absolutely useless for a tech. I remember that. Uh, like Sal, Peter, and Josh didn't drink. And at this at the show, there was this in the dress the band's dressing room. It was like literally a garbage can, like a one of the regular like steel garbage cans, the mm -hmm. the big ones filled with beer. So while the band played, we drank all the beer and. It, <laughs> <laughs> By the end of the show, I was falling on my face. <laughs> so, hence why I'm better at being in the band than working for right. them. Well, and I, there may have been like one or two local shows where I helped the band out, like, you know, teching for them and stuff. But, you know, that, that was about the extent of, of my teching for the band. I think it became more of a, uh, uh, like a press release, you know, that Johnny was yeah. the project, and then he joined the, yeah. the band, you know. Well, I mean, they really didn't play all that much before right. I joined the band. Uh, you know, they did one tour in the U.S., and I think Peter, you know, like quit, and he he, he canceled the tour. I think they got maybe like two weeks of dates. They were out with the, the Exploited. Mm -hmm. And then they went to Europe on the, on the first record also. And there was a lot of controversy surrounding the band, like, you know, uh, saying that Peter was a, you know, like a fascist, he was a Nazi, he was a misogynist, he was all this stuff. And so there were like protests and all kinds of things like that surround everywhere the band went. So they went to Europe for like two weeks, three weeks. And I think they did maybe like, like a handful of shows, if that many. Well, what is it? So one of the interesting things about Peter is that he always kept a job. He did. Uh, he kept. He quit his job when we were in the middle of touring with Motley Crue. Right, but that's when I first when I first joined the band. It was. Uh, you know, I remember Peter used to come to my shop where I worked at. He used to come and hang out, and I, I worked on that that car for him a, a few times. And, and uh, before I joined the band, and he came to you know talk to me about playing in the band. He was saying, uh, you know, don't, don't quit your day job. It's not, it's not that kind of band. It's, you know, that's not, that's not what we're going to do. I don't, I don't have any interest in, you know, like being a rock star or like, you know, like making it or, you know, it was like, you know, playing the band, you know, if we'll play on the weekends, like, you know, maybe locally or something like that, you know, and I, just, I just saw it as an opportunity. Typo was like one of my favorite bands. So I didn't care if we played like, you know, once a year, I didn't give a shit. I wanted to be in the band. And um, he worked for the parks department in Brooklyn. Yeah. Yeah, he did. And so what would, what would, like, what would he do? What would, what would a day for Peter Steele be like at the parks department? Peter, I remember like when Peter first got the job, he was doing that. I was working at the post office. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would see each other at rehearsal studios, at, at the rehearsal studio with different bands and stuff like that. And we would talk about like, you know, like our health coverage, like, you know, like, what, what, you know, what do you, what do you get? Blah, blah, blah. What do you get? Uh, Peter, like, I always thought of Peter as like, I think he always just wanted to be like a regular guy. Because he couldn't just like go to the grocery store to, you know just get something without some kind of crazy shit happening to him. There was always something insane, always following him around. And of course, like, you know, given the way that he looked and stuff like that. Well, he was six, he foot, just, six foot eight and uh, yeah, he was big. He had, you know, like his, his look was very striking and stuff. So he, he couldn't just go to a bar and hang out. Like he, he couldn't just be like a regular guy, like, you know, just to do like regular things. There was always something else, 
you know, the, it, it always attracted something else. And then he, especially like, you know, when the band was touring, and, like, Kenny and I would always be able, we'd just, wherever we were playing, we could just go to the bar, you know, before or afterwards, have a couple of drinks and pretty much, you know, fans would recognize you, but they would pretty much give you your space. Right. The minute Peter came out, if he would come out to hang out with us, he, he would make it for maybe like not even five minutes and then he'd have to turn around. I, I have to go. Yeah. Because he couldn't just hang out. He had to be Peter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, he, his personality was such a part of that band. And obviously he was not a guy who could just um, hide. But it's so it's funny, though, that this this guy that really this is someone that people idolized is still working at the parks department while the band you know has has a platinum album oh yeah he had oh no that's the timeline on that is totally different bloody bloody kisses didn't go platinum until oh, okay shit like seven years after it came out it was oh. gold it was gold in 95 when we were doing all that touring when we went out with all those bands supporting all those those bigger bands and stuff that the touring cycle for bloody kisses by the end of it the band had had a gold record right and was Plat he still, platinum was, he was years later and was he still working? By that point, no. We oh. were the first big tour that we really like. The first really big tour that we did was when we were going out with Motley Crue. We were touring with Motley Crue when Karabi was singing for the band. Okay. And uh, we, during that trip, I remember it, like that New York City was going through some uh, fiscal stuff, and they were offering. Um, buyout packages for city employees mm -hmm. and at that time he t t t he took that <laughs> so, <laughs> crazy. but up, up until that point you know all the years that peter had worked there he had accumulated all kinds of sick time and vacation time and stuff like that so all the touring that he did he was put he had a paycheck coming in it's amazing, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah I mean, and then he then he he took the plunge and quit his job I quit my job at the shop like around the same time. And then everybody was able to commit full time the typo negative. And you guys knew that this, it was taking off. I mean, it, it, this was a big time. No, no but, I mean, we always knew that we, that we thought we had something special, but we always felt that, it was, you know, like the, the bottom was going to fall out at any minute. You know, every, every time we got home after a trip, it was like, oh, I guess that's it. You know, go back to work and, you know, do what we always did, you know, play on the weekends and, you know, get a job, you know, and figure to go back to work at another shop, you know, turning wrenches and stuff. And Peter yeah. always thought that he might be able to get his job back at the park, at the parks department. Incredible. Kind of, kind of yeah. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. So we, we never, we never really looked that far ahead. We were like, wow, this is, you know, it's pretty cool at the moment, but you know, we had quit our jobs, but it didn't really mean that it didn't equate to actually making money. <laughs> What made we were making a little bit of money? We had worked out like when we would do our budgets, you know, like when we would set up for a tour, we managed to work out where we get a little bit of a salary for ourselves. Right. So, so like if if the tour was a complete bust or you know, or like it, it lost money or anything, at least we had a little bit of something where we could pay some bills when we got home. And but each tour got a little bit and a little bit better and stuff, but it's still at the time, like, you know, like the, where the band's success was, you know, the, the money really wasn't there yet. When we got, when we finished touring for the record, we were able to renegotiate our uh, record deals and merch deals and publishing deals and stuff like that. Cause we, we had, now that we had the cloud of a, of a gold record, we had a little bit more, yeah, you know, a little, a little bit more say in the matter, I guess. And so what, a little, what made Sal leave the band? That gave that gave you the opportunity. What was that about? Well, well, for start, like like I said, you know, Peter didn't want to tour. And Peter had no ambitions to to pursue music as a career. It was it was pretty it was safe to say he considered it a hobby, right? And Sal wanted it to be a career, and he had just finished doing the record for Life of Agony. He did the session, mm -hmm. and Josh had produced that first Life of Agony record and wasn't happy with the drummer that they had so he had sal come in and do the record and so sal had the option of you know like the, the, they were ready 
they they had the ambition they they wanted to go for it they were going to go on the road they wanted to you know try to make a go at it yeah and sal said i'm gonna go with them you know instead of instead of not you know instead of basically staying home <laughs> yeah I mean, and I then guess after, I, after sal left i joined the band and then uh, months later i was in the band for a number of months before we actually went on a tour and it was pretty shocking when i was i remember it was pretty shocking i remember my manager calling me asking me if i could get six weeks off of work to go on tour and i was like wait a second i was like peter doesn't tour why you know he doesn't want to tour what, what's going on he's like well we got peter to do it peter's got six weeks of vacation time so he said that he would he would give it a shot and we did that and then it just it was just one after another and i was doing that to my job so much where i was disappearing for weeks on end and when i say i worked in a shop i was a, it was a one-man shop at a like a pet boys but it was only one garage and i was the only guy right <laughs> so like when i was out when i was out the shop was closed <laughs> so, so i kept on dis i kept on disappearing and then it finally i had to quit right because it well, wasn't fair to the shop yeah and, um, so you, uh, but that's you, and it just i guess it like snowballed but at the same time like you know like we were you know working through the whole thing but yes yeah, sal left because the band did, wasn't going to go anywhere which opened and then a lot after of sal left and then the, the plans changed yeah and uh and so even though you didn't play on the record you did the touring for it and all the uh you know you're breaking up the album you're breaking up Oh, I was saying that you did all the uh, you know promotion for this record. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, I think Sal maybe did one show with the band after the record, like when the record was done, maybe one or two shows, if if that many. But like any touring for that record, Sal wasn't in the band at that point. Yeah, he'd been out of the band for a while. Yeah, and so um, so you toured for this record, and and obviously it was starting to take off. I think we lost him. Now, this is a first. All right, I'm sure he'll come back. Hold on. Let's see what we can do to make this. Uh... All right. This is what happens when you have internet technology. People are going to come and go, and he's far away. We were, we're going to talk about uh, the next record, but we're going to see how fast uh, Johnny Kelly returns. Um, Anyway, so I mean, look, we're learning a lot so far. Um, this band is, you know, you hear these stories about these bands that get together and they go on the road and, you know, become big stars. This is a, here we go, Johnny's back. Hold on. You're in the middle of talking and it just. Johnny, it, it, was, it was, I told the best story ever. It was amazing. <laughs> you'll, have, you'll have to watch the, you'll have to watch the, the replay. Okay. But Johnny, I was going to get into, um, October Russ, because you've been in the band for a while. Come 96, you're going to make uh, a record with this band. Um, and so I, I got to tell you, I've always wondered, I got so many questions about that band, but I've always wondered, what is it like writing a typo negative record? Uh, because you're not in a typical band. Actually, if, you know, looking back and looking back at each record and how we went about, ma about making the records, that was the record that Peter was the most uh, prepared for. Mm -hmm. He had a lot of stuff written while we were traveling on supporting Bloody Kisses. And uh, I remember when, uh, like, one of the first things that he showed that he had brought in, you know, we had gotten our own rehearsal studio at this point. You know, we, we needed a place. Because up until that point, we always went to an hourly studio right. to rehearse. So now we had, uh, we had gotten our own facility. We got our own room. And uh, we could go there anytime we wanted and stuff. And so we had this our own place to work. And um, I, like the first thing that he showed us was Love You to Death. Mm -hmm. And I remember hearing it, like, you know, just hearing, he was just like, you know, just humming along. I don't even, I'm not even sure if he had like, like lyrics yet or anything, but he had the melody line and he was playing, like, you know, playing the bass, you know, basically showing all of us what he had written. It was like the minute I heard it, I was like, this is going to be a fucking great song. And yeah. then, uh, 
you know, like some stuff would come together easy. Some stuff was like a total chore. Uh, by the end of it, we were all like, you know, completely mentally and physically exhausted. You know, we like, you know, the record was done. You know, it was like the minute it, the minute it was finished, it was like, don't fucking call me. <laughs> don't call. I don't want to see you. I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> it bye when when peter sets out to make these songs does he know that the you know i'm gonna write a really long song like or is it that just that the style or does it just happen it happens that way peter always had to think for symmetry so if something was done it had to be done eight times and if it was done like you know whatever four or eight times and if it was you know 60 beats per minute then it would really stretch out and then it'd be you know <laughs> Yeah, and then it'd be all right, we're going to the next part. This part has to be this long, and then that would get stretched out. And then soon you knew it, you had an eleven-minute song. Uh, yeah. But it was never, it was never. Um, I, I wouldn't say it was by design. I think it was just, you know, that's just the way it happened. And uh, Peter actually, with October Rust, he had more. Uh, he was trying to do more, write more with a pop sensibility to it to try to write shorter songs. Right. <laughs> Because he well he did have some occasionally they they would sneak out some some of them were you know basic simple to the point you know uh, like like girlfriend's girlfriend you know like right. it's a simple simple song it's you know nothing I mean it's certainly not epic um and you know the arrangement and everything is you know you pretty standard you know standard fare you know yeah and, was a, and you had radio edits for most of these songs pretty so much we had to have all of them because uh i think at, at the time i don't know what the standard is now and a single a song couldn't be more than four and a half minutes right that so, would be like an intro for a typo negative song yeah, yeah like it's it's unfortunate like especially when you looked at songs like christian woman or black number one and how they got chewed up to fit that fit that format and you know at first you didn't want to do it but then it was you know the only way that other people are going to get to that people are ever going to get to hear what we're doing is if it gets on the radio especially back then you know all you had was terrestrial terrestrial radio yeah and in tv uh, well they were never going to play us anyway but they well, wound up playing. yeah <laughs> but they had no that's a whole other story that's a whole other podcast yes yeah. getting, getting on a video TV. You know how many re rejected edits they gave us? They came up with all kinds because it got to a point, right? Not to jump off, not to. No, know, no, it's interesting. It got to a point the band was getting too popular. They couldn't ignore us anymore. They, they, they were going to have to put us on Headbangers Ball. Right. They didn't want to. They didn't like the band, and it's you know, and that's okay. You know, whatever. They didn't like it. But it had gotten too big; they couldn't ignore it anymore. So we we did we would do we would do these videos, and they kept on rejecting them. They were saying, "No, this uh, like uh, like the Love You to Death video." Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they'd always come back with like a list of it can't have this and this the, that we're objecting to this. This is crossing the line, like uh, the girl with the with the baby with the doll. You yeah. know, like they were. She, she can't be stabbing the doll, you know, can't do this, can't. And they would come up with all kinds of excuses to avoid having to play the video. Finally, we submitted versions that they would approve. And, it, you know, it probably gets played a lot more now, I think, than it did back then. Yes, I think things are much more accepted now. I and mean, if you go to YouTube, those videos, you know, they have million, millions of videos. Yeah. But back then it was it was really tough. They they just you know they you know the band just didn't fit in with their formats and stuff. Actually, I just heard I'd seen recently. Recently, I, I say recently, it was a few years ago. Yeah. And there was something VH1 had some kind of uh, poll. And it was people like, you know, they went and voted online and shit like that. And anyway, the polling came out. We beat Bon Jovi. We were like the most popular. If, I forget what, what song, if it was a video or something like that. And it was, Typo had won. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and 
Yeah, I, I wish Peter could have come up. <laughs> when they came to air the show, Bon Jovi had one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, but you were saying it, it was almost like you, that your success was sort of getting forced on these people. You know, the, the uh, I know you did last summer movie. Uh, right. Yeah. 97, you guys, you know, the, the cover of uh, Summer Breeze, which you had for yeah. a while, ends up being the intro to the, to it's the movie. The opening, it's the opening piece of cinema. You know, it's like the opening piece of audio, everything, when the song, when the movie starts. And it's a huge soundtrack, you know, so people mm. are discovering it through that. And then, um, you know, the cover of Cinnamon Girl, Howard Stern's playing yeah, in. I, know. You know. <laughs> I had heard, I, I remember uh, when, uh, he had Stern had Neil Young on on mm -hmm. the show, and uh, he was talking about our version of Cinnamon Girl, and he's like, "Have you ever heard of this?" And he was Neil Young wasn't wasn't aware of it at all. He had no idea that we had covered it. Right. And I didn't hear it. Uh, I heard it later on. I saw something online, but at the at that time, like uh, friends of mine were calling. My phone started blowing up. Friends of mine called. How it's talking about typo, blah blah blah, blah with, with Neil Young, this and that. And I, just, I, I missed it, but. But it's always like, you know, like the band has been a, a little, has been a part of like subculture a little bit, you know, it's always been like the undercurrent of, you know, what's going on or, you know, and we like wouldn't we go said, away. <laughs> you can't no. get rid of us. <laughs> and like said, people who loved it, loved it. There was no in between for those, that hardcore typo base. And you guys were touring and playing festivals, massive overseas, massive festivals. So you were reaching a large audience. Yeah, it, it was like we had we had uh, our audience, but it was, I think it was a lot of it was like something I guess like in everybody felt a little more personal, mm -hmm. personal about it, you know, because it never really went full mainstream, right? And like it had almost gotten there a couple of times, like you know you had like like records would come out, you get respectable chart numbers and things like that, but. It was just always like, you know, below the radar. It was just never cool enough to like, you know, be the end thing. Or it was either that or, you know, like the flip side of it is, you know, like the band never really reached its full potential. Well, and I think, though, for the fans at the time, it was their band. You know, I think in yeah. some ways it, it was still theirs. It didn't get away from them. Um, yes. And, and now the band, you know. Type of negative would now be considered a legendary band. I mean, there's young people who are getting Which in. Which is fun. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't ever see that coming. Um, no, not at all. Not at all. But uh, I didn't. I didn't. I was surprised that we made it out of the '90s. Yeah, like that we made it to the end of the '90s because at that point, you know, like I, I had the band. You know, the the band had been around for you know almost ten years, and it was like. Where's it going to go from here? You know, that's, you know, what's, well, I did, and, you, and you never worked under the premise of like, oh yeah, like, you know, this is forever, you know, right. unless it was like, unless it was like, a, you know, like a song that you didn't like, you'd be like, oh shit, this is going to be around forever. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, but do you never, like, we never like ever considered anything that was a legacy or something, you know, like never really considered it especially when you're in something and you're in it and you're just like you're just doing your thing you don't think about how it's oh, gonna be this... right you know you're like jesus am i going to be able to like you know like pay my bills next month and that's about what's going to be you know 20 years from now well i want to ask you a little bit about peter because um you know this is definitely this larger than life character and I once asked Johnny Ramone, I said, after spending some time with Dee Dee and the other guy, I said, how did you tour with these nuts? You know, um, and <laughs> not to say that Peter was a nut, but there was a time when he was drinking, using drugs, and he also yeah. was admitted bipolar. And yeah. so how do you travel with a guy like that? Well, I, you know, like for the most part, you kind of knew, you know, what was going on. It was uh, when, you know, substance abuse got worse. It was then it was you know, are we going to go on tour? We didn't even know, you know, you wasn't, wasn't unsure if Peter was going to, you know, be able to. And, uh, but, you know, as long as, I guess like, you know, as long as he was healthy enough, then it was, you know, sometimes, you know, it depended on the day. You never really knew, like, you know, like 
you never know who's going to come out from the back of the box. <laughs> really? But for the most part, he was, you know, was, you know, like the earlier stuff, he was very easy to tour with, you know, like, yeah, he, whatever, you know, he was taking, uh, you know, medication from, his, you know, his prescriptions and stuff like that. So a lot of it was under control. A lot of stuff, like, you know, a lot of things got, you know, he turned to uh, exercise, you know, working out. You know, right. that was that was his drug. And so he was always into, you know, like exercise and redheads. <laughs> well, was he was he a nice guy? Because all the impressions I've heard is that he was very nice. Yeah. Yeah, he was nice. He was a he was very much like, you know, like the class clown, you know, always, you know, always cracking jokes, stuff like that. Always. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, like when it would be a little more serious when we, were, you know, whatever, working on new music and stuff. And, you know, but for the most part, when we were just hanging out, he was always clowning around. Right. You know, like, you know, at the end of the night, you know, whatever, we'd, everybody be drunk on the bus. We're all sitting there screaming Beatles and Black Sabbath songs on, you know, like over the stereo. And you know, he'd be in the mix with it, you know, hanging out with everybody for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, because to, to an outsider, he would look like a scary guy. Well, physically, yeah, he had a scary look to him. But like once he started talking to you and stuff like that, he was, wasn't, you know, unless he was, you know, like when the, when the drugs and the, the drinking got really bad, then you really didn't know who you were dealing with. You know, but other than that, you know, even then it was like, you know, it was pretty easy, you know, pretty easy to, I guess, like, you know, manage to, to you know, get along with. And, yeah. And he, he did make the shows, right? I mean, you, did you have to cancel anything? Uh, I think over the years, I think we canceled one show. That's pretty impressive. You know, and, sort of... Yeah, it could have been a whole lot worse. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we cut, we, cut one, we cut a show short. We also cut a show short because of me. What, what happened to you? I went skiing. I went snowboarding for the first time in uh, Utah. Okay. I don't know how to snowboard. <laughs> right. You found out the hard way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I fell down uh, like Kenny and our, uh, like our light guy, tour manager guy, you know, this, we were on tour with Pantera mm -hmm. and uh, our light guy and Kenny, they like to snowboard. They, you know, they've, they've done it, you know? And so I, they were like, come with us. And so I went, and I was like, I've never done this before. And Kenny was like, did you ever ride a skateboard? I was like, yeah. I've, you know, when I was a kid, I rode a skateboard. He's like, it's just like riding a skateboard. Mm. I was like, okay. So uh, they took me down like one of the bunny mountains or something like that. Uh, and they were like, how do you feel? I was like, I'd like to do it one more time. They were like, oh, fine. And I, was, I wasn't getting the hang of it. I go like a, I go a few yards and stuff, and then I fall and roll down and shit. Mm. And they were like, oh, you're doing great. Come on, let's go. What is it, a black diamond, a blue diamond hill mountain? And blue diamond, yeah. Yeah, they were like, "Come on!" And so they blue diamond, the kiss blue I fell all right. Okay, I fell all the way down this blue diamond hill, and I was like, "I can't do it anymore." And I just went and sat and wait for waited for them in the car. I was like, I don't know, like because they went back up. They were like, "We're gonna go do it again." And I got we got back to the hotel. I couldn't move. I was like, you know, I couldn't even breathe. I, I'm pretty sure I cracked a couple of ribs. And then uh, we had a show that night. Mm -hmm. This was like totally stupid. And so we, we played, played like half the show and I'm like struggling throughout the whole set. And I just turned around to Peter and the guys. I was like, that's it. I was like, I can't do it anymore. I can't. <laughs> so we, we end the set early, we get off stage. Peter's like, what happened? I was like, I don't know. I went. I was like, I, I can't move. I went snowboarding with Kenny. And he's like, you fucking took him snowboarding. Yes, that bad management right away. Yeah. First of all, people from Brooklyn shouldn't snowboard. That's first. Actually, the two of them, they were fine. It right. was me that couldn't do it. I was, I had, I had a hockey jersey on. It had the number nine on it. It looked like number six all the way down the mountain. <laughs> I didn't know that I could fall so many times. It it's funny that Peter, who's this extreme character, is he, yeah. <laughs> looking at you from the show. Yeah. Um, but so I'm, I'm, I mean, we're jumping ahead. We could talk about yeah. we could talk about uh, you know typo for forever. <laughs> right. but I, 
Uh, but I want to uh, move ahead to uh, to dead again because mm-hmm. uh, this will be the last um, typo record. I believe this is yeah. 2007. Is that right? Mm-hmm. And so, um, what was the morale and of the band at this point? At that point, making that record was pretty crazy. Uh, mostly, this was mostly. Peter with me and Kenny in a room, Josh, Josh was working on, we were doing a DVD at the time and Josh was spending a lot of time working on the DVD. And we were going to, we had a rehearsal studio in Rockaway, Rockaway beach. Yeah, We had, it was like literally a block away. It got the whole studio got decimated during the Superstorm Sandy. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, um, we would go there. We so again, we had our own room at the, at this place, and we would go there. The first room that we had, it was above a Chinese restaurant, and they kicked us out because we were too loud. So they moved us in another room to another building across the street. There in New York, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we would go there. I, I would pick. Peter really wasn't driving at this point, and you know, he was he was doing a lot of drinking. You know, not, not really doing any drugs from what I remember, but he was doing a lot of drinking. So anyway, at least he had the, the wherewithal to not drive. So I pick him up at his house and we go out to Rockaway and uh, we would just jam for, for hours, hours. We were going to the studio approximately five to six nights a week, just rehearsing, just working on songs. And, uh, you know, that was like Peter's like socializing time. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, he was like, you know, he was at that point where he was sleeping most of the day and then he'd be up all night. We'd pick him up like, a, you know, like around like dinner time ish. And then we'd go, go rehearse. And we would, uh, we would go to the studio. It was like, yeah, like a good, like five, six nights a week, just, just jamming, just uh, like, you know, trying, we would, uh, like it, with with this record and the other ones, Peter didn't really have anything prepared. He'd have maybe a couple of ideas here and there, a couple of little things, and uh, we would w- work with him to create the songs there on the spot. And then when we finally had some kind of, you know, like when the songs had structure and things like that, then it was then we would move on to the next phase. And with Peter, he was always like, you know, like is the thing he would always say, the possibilities are endless. <laughs> it's like Peter, we can't try every single possibility. I remember telling him, I was like, I was like, Peter, we got to record. I was like, the songs are getting worse. <laughs> we're, we're, but like he doing... said, this was his social. Yeah, time. This, this this was his time, and it was like you know, like he'd hang out, and we'd, you know, be like it would be the three of us or the four of us, and. You know, and he was out of the house and he was, you know, doing stuff. And then, you know, sometimes he'd get really drunk. And it was sometimes we'd, uh, you know, we'd get into fights on the way there and just turn the truck around and go home and so, talk to you tomorrow. I'm not, I'm not, you know, we're not doing this tonight, you know, stuff like that. It was like, you know, like your, your usual chaos that always surrounded typo negative. I, I could imagine. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, we should point out, your career has really, you've worked with two of the larger than life front men there are, which is Peter Steele and then Glenn Danzig as well. <laughs> and which is, we'll get to, but because this is really crazy, but uh, you were already playing with Danzig at this point. Is, is that right? You at had- that point when we did that record? Yeah. 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 I started playing with Glenn at the, uh, like the end of 2002. Mm-hmm. Like the first tour that I did with Glenn was when Joey C left to join Queens of the Stone Age. Yeah. And so, um, and I know Kenny played with you as well from Typo. He was playing guitar a little bit with Danzig, right? He did. He did. Uh, he did one tour with us. He did. A, it was like a, like a short, like Halloween ish run. It's like most of the shows were on the West Coast. It was, it was like maybe like two weeks, two and a half weeks, something like that. Right. And so, and then also- Tommy came back. Okay, gotcha. And then also at this time, um, Peter's doing Carnivore again. He's doing some shows with that, I think. Yeah, right? some of it, yeah. So yeah, I mean, he started so- doing Carnivore. I remember when uh, he started doing Carnivore, 
when we had finished making the Dead Again record. Okay. And he was telling me, Kenny, he was like, he's like, uh, he goes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna do Carnivore again. He was like, uh, he's like, do you want to do it? And I was like, no, I'm busy. I was like, no way. I'm. I was like, I got to get away from you. <laughs> I didn't say that to him, but I was like, I got to get away from this guy. Just we just finished this record. Took a piece of my soul. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, and then Kenny, like, uh, Kenny calls me, like, you know, like I don't know, like a couple of weeks later, he's like, you got to do it. You got to do Carnivore. I was like, why? I was like, I finally said no to a gig, and now you're telling me I have to do it. <laughs> you guys kind of have a brother type relationship, right? You and Kenny. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and Peter and Josh. Like you know, it was. It was like it was like four old ladies. Like, you see the old ladies arguing at like a diner or something like that. That that was that was the band. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so Kenny was like, "You got to do it." It was like, "What do you mean?" I, I was like, "I told I told him no." I said, "I told him like I I would do it if you did it." <laughs> <laughs> oh. Amazing. So now you have to do it. <laughs> I mean, essentially, it would have been typo as carnivore. It, though. Yeah, it would have been typo playing carnivore songs. But anyway, you know, I was whatever. He wound up getting other guys to play in the band, like you know, to do carnivore. But yeah, it was it was like right after we finished doing the the typo record, Peter started up with carnivore, and I was just I was I really I honestly I was I was just so burnt out. I, I could imagine. And so burnt out. And so now, the last typo show was that on? Was it on Halloween? Yeah. So I mean, of all things, to a day stand in Detroit, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, at Harpo's. Yeah. How, how made Halloween? How fitting? Now, Halloween, I mean, yeah. obviously, you didn't know that this was going to be the last. Oh, no, had, had nobody. Nobody knew any of that stuff. You know, there was there weren't any telltale signs or anything. You know, Peter was actually healthy. He had, he had been sober for eight months and uh like when you when you would talk to him he was uh you know like optimistic and you know he was looking forward to like working on a new record he was looking forward to, he was uh glad to be moving back to new york he was living out in scranton right the scranton area and uh you know he was coming back to new york to start working on a record so that we could all be closer together and uh so like it, when it, like when you talk to peter you know for the most part you never really never really spoke like optimistically you mm -hmm. know, it was always like that tongue-in-cheek and the, you know it was always you know something you know like i don't want to say depressing because i don't think that's the accurate word right but yeah it, it just was wasn't usually optimistic so this was unusually optimistic and he was he was really excited about it, and I, you know, like I would talk to him a lot on the phone after he after he got cleaned up, and uh, you know, he was he was basically you know he was getting his act together, and, you know, getting you know putting his life back in order, and uh, uh, he was telling me he was like you know he goes I'm really looking forward to to writing you know to writing this new record, he's like. He goes, I haven't really, like, you know, I haven't really written with passion. Mm -hmm. He's like, you know, like the last, you know, like the last few years, he's like, you know, I've just been, you know, not really applying himself, basically, is what he was saying. He was really looking forward to having a clear head and to be able to apply himself to making a record. So I, I thought, you know, I've always taken the, the, the stand of, like, it, it was probably Typo's best record that could have come because when, now he really, he really wanted to do this and he was motivated to to making good music and i i always felt that typo never really reached its full potential i'm sure yeah you know i i think peter peter was that talented you know that some of the stuff like some of the stuff it just felt like he was like you know kind of like settling or like you know like color by numbers kind of stuff sometimes sure. and then you know then there, there would be like you know like these pieces of of gold in in between you know a lot of that and it would, you would really see, like, you know, like what potential, like the sky was the limit with him if he wanted it to be. And so I was really excited about seeing what what kind of music he would come up with, with a clear head and, and motivated, you know, inspired. Was that show in Detroit yeah. the last time you would see Peter? Uh, actually, yeah. 
yeah, now that now that you mention it, right? Because no, 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 it wasn't. Uh, after the show, uh, one of his sisters passed away. Okay. And I saw I saw him at the at the service. And so that was in that was a, the service was in New York. Yeah, yeah, it was in it was in Staten Island. Okay. Um, I remember seeing. I, I didn't see him long because he couldn't stay long. And uh, I couldn't, I couldn't stay for whatever reason. I couldn't stay long either, even though like the service, it wasn't far from my house or anything like that. You know, I lived relatively close by. And uh, I want to say that December, maybe January, it was like somewhere around like the holidays. Mm -hmm. I can't remember if it was before or after, but it's cold. That was, too. that was that was the last time I saw him. Yeah. Yeah. And and so um you know, Peter passes away in 2010. Um mm -hmm. he had divertic diverticulitis, right? Um which is a stomach disease, is that right? Uh yeah. He, uh it was perforated. He uh sepsis. Okay. And so how long before he was diagnosed to the point that he that he passed? Was he suffering for a while? No, this was just a couple of days when um, my understanding of it, like I said, I used to speak to him a lot over the phone. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had tried getting in touch with him the night before. I was trying to get in touch with him the night before. He didn't, he didn't answer the phone. But a few days before that, his one of his cats was really sick and his cat passed away. Mm -hmm. And Peter, like his cats were his children. Yeah. And I remember him telling me, like, you know, like at that time, he was like, you know, it was like, a, I forget what cat it was, but the cat wasn't doing well. He was really sick and it was costing Peter a lot of money to, to treat the cat. And I just remember telling him, I said, you're more of a humanitarian than I am. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but at the same time, I was kind of concerned because Peter had been sober and was like, you know, one of his cats, you know, passing away. I, I was worried that that could send him off, you know, over the edge and a relapse. Yeah. So I was, th I was just assuming the worst. I was like, I'm trying to get in touch with Peter. He's not answering his phone. His cat just passed away. Who knows where he is or what he's doing? And I was like, it can't be good. <laughs> and then uh, I was like, wait, he has a landline. <laughs> I forget that he had an actual landline. And where he lived, he had very ter terrible service. So I called his landline and like his girlfriend answered the phone. And I was like, hey, what's going on over there? And was, she was like, oh, Peter's in bed. He's not feeling well. He's got like the flu or something. I was like, is there anything I should know about what's going on over there? Cause she knew like, you know, like we were very, whatever. We talked a lot about, about Peter and you know, yeah. uh, treatment and stuff like that. And I was like, anything I should know about anything going on out there? You know, she was like, no, no, she's, he's really sick. <laughs> I was like, oh, all right. You know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. We had some business, you know, whatever. Tell him to call me when he feels better, you know? And she was like relaying messages to Peter in bed while I was on the phone with her. And then, uh, like the, I don't know, like the next day, no, that, that night, his sister called me and said that he had passed away. Wow. And, uh, but as far as like any kind of like, you know, like, uh, you know, intestinal issues or anything like that, he had, you know, he, he wasn't aware of it. Yeah. You so know, at that point, like everything that he had done to himself and all the shit that he did to, to abuse his body. And survived it. We thought he was going to like live forever at that point. We thought we were going to be like, at that point, we were like, all right, we're going to be another motorhead and we're just going to do this until we're, you know, old and can't move anymore. You didn't think an intestinal issue was going to be how it ended? No, with Peter, no. Yeah. I mean, you know, at, with all the things, like all the times that he had, like, you know, done, you know, what he, the punishment that he put his body through over the years. No, that was like the last thing. I thought for sure it would have like if it was like two years prior and then he had passed away. Then I wouldn't have been I wouldn't have been surprised to hear it. At right. that point, I, I was very surprised. I was you know it, it really was a shock because you weren't expecting it because he had really he he done so much to turn his life around. You know. Yeah, um, it was like so all right. You know, he, he got through it. You know, he he got to, he went through hell and I, he survived it. And now, like you know go on with the rest of his life yeah and so so what happens i mean do you go to the uh 
I know he's buried in a family plot on the, on the East Coast. Did, did you guys all go to the services? I went to the wake. Um, at the, I went to the wake. I went, I went to the, the funeral service. I didn't go to the burial. Uh, there was a lot of, um, his family had a hard time getting his body from Pennsylvania to New York. Okay. I guess like, you know, like there's certain, uh, you know, laws regarding how, a, how a body is treated after it's deceased and to go toward, you know, cross state lines or whatever. Anyway, it took, it took them a long time to get Peter to back to Brooklyn. Yeah. And so when he passed away, uh, really didn't think much of it at the time. Uh, I had a, there was a, a big radio show with Danzig. Danzig had, had some, had some shows. Mm -hmm. And at the time, like, you know, like on the timeline of it, this was like, they were, it was like a couple of weeks away from when Peter passed away. And Glenn at the time, he was like, you know, you, you know if you, if you want, you know, we'll cancel the, cancel the show. And I was uh, at the time, I was just like, you know what? I was like, let's just do it. It'll, it'll be weeks later. You know, it'll, it'll be all right. We'll, we'll deal with it. Um, and then it was, it really worked out like it, it, not to, you know, it didn't work out well, but it, it worked out. I had to leave to fly to California. It took that long where there was the, you know, the wake was a couple of days and the, the, the funeral and then the burial was in the afternoon. I had, I went to the church and then from the church, I went to the airport to go to California. And uh, so I didn't go to the burial. I've been to, I've been to the cemetery. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been there a couple of times. Now I, I don't get to go there now. I live in Texas. Right. Well, no one's going anywhere right now. So yeah. Right. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. But it, it, it's always there. And I, you know, I want to point out as we kind of close the chapter on typo negative, at least for this conversation is that there's also a, there was an Oak tree planted in prospect park, which is where he yeah. worked. I'm sure he loved it. And that yeah. so fans can go visit this, this tree. And I think they do. Yeah, the, the fans, uh, I forget her name, but a fan uh, organized the whole thing and, you know, like did, the, did the, dr the drive to like, you know, get the requests and the donations and stuff like that. It really had nothing to do with the band. It was just the fans, fans did it. So that kind of made it extra special, I think. And Again, I bet it's there's something. A tree, there's a tree and there's a, a bench in his name that they also, the fans also put that together. 